Uh, Dr. Hollander is a professor of history at Iowa State. He earned his undergraduate degree from the University of Chicago and his PhD from Columbia University. He is the author of Money in the Late Roman Republic and Farmers and Agriculture in the Roman Economy. He edited the Extra Mercantile Economies of Greek and Roman Cities with Thomas Blanton and John Fitzgerald. With Kim Howe, he edited a companion to Ancient Agriculture that is due out next month. He also serves as the general editor for Wiley's Encyclopedia of Ancient History. Professor Hollander has taught at Iowa State for more than 18 years and has especially enjoyed taking students to Italy as part of study abroad class and co lead with Professor Rachel Myers of World Languages and Cultures, who's here and is also going to be giving a talk for us um, later in the month. So uh, please help me in welcoming Dr. Hollander. Well, thank you, and uh, thanks for coming, although I have to say I've never been so happy to see such a uh, small audience. <laughs> um, thank you to the Bernier for inviting me to speak, and especially to, uh, to Sarah Bartlett uh, for putting the exhibit together and, and telling me things like, Iowa State has some ancient uh, Greek pots and, and Roman coins. I did not know that. Um, <laughs> Uh, anyway, Sarah's so taking a bunch of classes with me, and, and you, you could not ask for, for a better student. Uh, and congratulations on your imminent uh, graduation. So I also want to thank one of my own teachers, uh, the late John Darns. About 20 years ago, when I was a graduate student, uh, John Darns, this historian, was then president of the American Council of Learned Societies in New York, but he was also teaching the occasional class at Columbia. Um, and I was fortunate enough to serve as his research assistant and uh, sit in on a class that he offered on foodways and social status in ancient Rome. Uh, and for me, the class was a real revelation. Um, I had no idea how rich the study of Roman food and dining practices um, were. Darm suggested that foods and wines function as social markers, that Roman society was divided into various tiers according to differential access to foodstuffs, and that the political and social aspirations, not only of the elite, but also of less exalted orders and groupings, were reflected in their convivial um, customs. It will always prove productive to ask, he argued, uh, what Romans in social terms ate, what foods, and what sorts of meals, with whom, where, on what occasion, uh, and for what larger, often symbolic, purposes. And I'm first going to try to briefly answer some, some of the questions that, uh, that John Darn asked. Uh, what foods did Romans eat? What were meals? With whom? Uh, and so on and so forth. Once that's out of the way, I plan to look at how Roman banqueting changed from the second century BC down to briefly the, um, the third century AD, um, and how various objects in this exhibit uh, illustrate developments during this period. So there's an old Seinfeld routine uh, where he talks about how there won't be fashion in the future um, because he says every time he sees a movie or a TV show where there's people from the future, they're all wearing the same thing. Somehow they decided this is going to be our outfit, one piece silver jumpsuit, V-stripe and boots. Um, we often have a very similar perception of the past. Uh, Romans wore togas, for example. Uh, now it's true that Sometimes some Romans wore togas, but most of the time, most Romans did not. Uh, in fact, the Roman satirist Juvenal joked that in much of Italy, to tell the truth, no one puts on a toga unless he's dead. Uh, it, was, it was what you, you know, were, were uh, dressed in for your uh, cremation. There's a similar misconception about Roman diet. Um, it's usually referred to as the Mediterranean triad, grain, olive oil, and wine. Uh, but calling this the Roman diet is as absurd as claiming that there's an American triad of hamburgers, fries, and soda. Romans did eat a fair amount of grains, olive oil, and wine, but their diet was much more uh, varied than Mediterranean triad implies. Uh, so before I get to the variation in foods, I should note the variation in Romans. Roman society was incredibly stratified. At the top during the Republic uh, were the senatorial and equestrian orders, uh, the richest and most powerful Romans. The decurions were the local uh, elites, the leading families in communities other than Rome. 
And beneath them were a wide range of moderately wealthy um, Romans, poorer Romans, freed slaves, um, and of course at the bottom, slaves. The situation is actually even more complicated than I've uh, indicated on this table, uh, but I don't want to get into the weeds here. Uh, many slaves and poorer Romans would have uh, only consumed a very limited range of foods, while the wealthy had access to nearly everything. The important thing to note here is that uh, social mobility was very much possible. Um, so um, slaves were often freed, gaining Roman citizenship. Uh, some freedmen became reasonably prominent. Similarly, local elites were able to become equestrians and senators. Downward mobility was also quite possible. Romans used food to assert their social class and where they stood within their class, just as they used clothing, jewelry, and cosmetics. Uh, although I would argue that uh, food was like the, the most important uh, way in which they demonstrated, um, informally at least, their, their status. Now, turning to a variation in the Roman diet, uh, on this slide I've tried to list as many of the foods the Romans ate as I can. Some items, such as bread, wheat, and uh, olive oil were probably eaten by most Romans on a fairly regular basis in the late Republic and early Empire um, and, and beyond. Um, Romans also ate a lot of pork, uh, and even poor Romans could consume meat in the form of sausages uh, or hope for the occasional better cut of meat at a religious festival. Garum, a uh, fish sauce that was used as a condiment, um, was extremely popular, uh, and Romans consumed it in uh, substantial, if you know, unquantifiable accounts. Uh, they also consumed pulses, fruits, vegetables, nuts, lots of seafood if they could, eggs, dairy products, honey, and seasonings. Um, and I've, I've listed some, some other uh, weird stuff here, like lead acetate, sometimes used as a sweetener. Um, obviously not something that uh, <clears throat> was conducive to good health. Uh, what you ate also varied with wealth, but by season and regionally. Uh, some things like milk didn't travel very well, um, but fish and meats were preserved with salt or vinegar or even sometimes honey uh, so that they could be transported long distances. Um, pretty much every conceivable food was available at Rome, but um, the Roman transportation network was such that you could get some fairly surprising foods at pretty remote places. So for example, edible snails were being shipped from Italy to Egypt and then into the desert uh, during the, the early empire. As for what Romans drank, uh, certainly a lot of wine, but also plenty of water. Uh, there was quite limited consumption of beer, uh, not much milk either. There were also cereal drinks, uh, such as alica, uh, made from spelt, and drinks made with vinegar and water, such as pasca. Uh, there was mead uh, wine and wine mixed with honey. Uh, heated beverages seem to have been quite popular. And wines were also made from a variety of fruits other than uh, grapes, and, and wines were flavored in, in various ways. Uh, mulsum, this mixture of wine and honey, was a particularly popular item. Uh, so again, lots of variation and opportunities for innovation or doing something unusual and striking. So just as there was a wide variety of foodstuffs available for consumption, there were also a bunch of different ways to prepare them. Uh, we have quite a few ancient recipes, though they can be very hard to interpret. Um, I, I you know, think of them as sort of like, I don't know if any of you have watched the, uh, the Great British Bake Off show, uh, the inscrutably concise uh, directions given for the, um, the technical challenges. Uh, somewhat remind me of the, the ancient recipes. Um, the Romans ate bread, porridge, polenta, cakes, pastries, stews, casseroles, omelets, hard and soft boiled eggs. Um, they seem to have been less interested in frying and grilling uh, meat than, than we are. The Romans seasoned their dishes with a wide range of herbs, spices, grated cheese, and as I've already noted, um, garum. Um, and this fish sauce, apparently it was more of a, a salty taste than a, than a fishy taste. It's worth noting, um, since some people aren't aware of this, that the Romans didn't have pizza, uh, nor did they have pasta. They had no tomatoes, potatoes, corn, or peanuts either. Um, and here's a good, as good a place as any to, to mention that um, even when the Romans ate roughly the same sort of things that we do, 
they often preferred to eat them differently or, or ranked foods differently. Uh, so for example, while they certainly ate some beef, it was not nearly as highly regarded um, as pork for them. Um, and they tended to prefer much fattier cuts of meat than, um, than I think the, the average modern person tends to. So while in what follows, I'm going to be focusing on the dinners of the elite, um, I want to round out this quick survey of what Romans ate with a brief discussion of the timing and location of Roman meals more generally. As you see here, the Romans did have meals roughly equivalent to our breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Um, so you can see there. Um, breakfast seems to have been fairly straightforward, a simple meal of uh, you know, bread and cheese. Uh, lunch, prandium, uh, might consist of bread with vegetables, cold meat, um, fruit, and possibly some wine. Um, the merenda was an afternoon snack or a late lunch. Uh, but the most important meal of the day was typically the cana, uh, the dinner, which would take place in the late afternoon or early evening. The words convivium and epulum um, also mean dinner, but imply more of a banquet or feast, um, a dinner party, if you will. We know that many women and children would uh, attend uh, these uh, dinners, um, but we know surprisingly little about sort of ordinary domestic meals, uh, whether the average Roman family would typically gather together at the end of, of every uh, day for, for a meal together. What we know the most about are the banquets of the elites, and these meals could be very formal or quite raucous. The hosts were expected to provide entertainment, which might include music, dancing, readings of poetry or prose, the witty banter of uh, guests, professional entertainers like mimes, acrobats, or gladiators. Um, and in some cases, we hear of uh, recreational gambling or even on one memorable occasion, a blind auction. Formal dinners often took place in a special dining room known as a triclinium. Uh, here you see a recreation of one uh, from the Naples Archaeological Museum. These tended to feature three couches with three guests reclining together on each of the three couches. Uh, guests lay on their left sides and would mainly consume food taken uh, from centrally placed tables with their right hands. Uh, this is something to keep in mind for, for later on when I'm talking about perfume, um, the fact that you know, guests are literally on top of one another, uh, not just close to one another, but touching one another. Now, although we have a, a range of Roman silverware, uh, Romans did mostly seem to eat with their hands. Elite Romans seem to have preferred to eat at home, uh, theirs or their friends' houses, uh, but there's tons of evidence to suggest that many non-elite Romans regularly ate at taverns, inns, and bars, and probably standing up on the street outside of such places. You can see an example of a taberna from Herculaneum on the slide. Uh, there are a lot of great examples of these sorts of establishments from, from all over the empire. Uh, we also hear of food for sale at the baths um, and in brothels. Um, indeed, women working in taverns were viewed legally as essentially equivalent to, to prostitutes. Upper class Romans generally viewed tabernae as dangerous and disreputable places. Uh, so once again, there's a tremendous amount of variation in when and where Romans eat and it can be closely related to one's status. Uh, and what follows, um, I want to show you um, basically how elite banquets changed over the centuries from the late Republic to the early Empire, um, and how the dining room was a place of competition uh, that generated some of the items that, that you see uh, around the corner there. We'll start in 200 BC or thereabouts. Um, in the previous century, the Romans had gone from a regional power in central Italy to masters of the Western Mediterranean. In 201, uh, the Romans had finished their longest and costliest war known as the Second Punic War. Um, they had defeated Hannibal and the Carthaginians and imposed a substantial indemnity upon them. Uh, so the dark blue areas on this map indicate the regions under direct Roman administration around 197. During the second century, the 100s, the Romans would come to dominate the rest of the Mediterranean, either through outright annexation uh, of territory or the use of client 
kings, so rulers who depended on Roman support to stay in power and so tended to do what the Romans wanted them to do, uh, hence effectively part of the empire. Um, but on this map, the dark blue areas are just indicating places directly controlled by Rome. Um, now, it's in the second century that Rome begins to get really, really rich. Uh, and the wealth came, and with this wealth came new extremes of luxury. Later Romans blamed a guy named Gnaeus Manlius Volso for initiating the problem. Uh, according to the historian Livy, uh, Volso's triumph over the Gauls of Asia in 187 featured Eastern luxuries like bronze couches, tapestries, and pedestal tables. He writes, this was when girls playing harps and lutes made their appearance at dinner parties together with other entertainments to amuse the guests. And the dinners themselves began to be put on with greater care and expense. This was when the cook for the ancients, the lowest slave in terms of worth and utility, began to be prized. And what had been menial labor to be regarded as an art. Um, the triumph of Aemilius Paulus in September of 167 marked another important moment. Paulus was celebrating his victory over Perseus in the Third Macedonian War. Uh, Macedon was the kingdom once ruled by Alexander the Great, and it was immensely wealthy. Um, the triumph lasted three days, and his biographer Plutarch says that among many other sites, this victory parade featured men carrying silver mixing bowls, drinking horns, drinking bowls, and cups, each shown off to its best advantage and each remarkable for its size and for the depth of chaste work on it. Uh, later, there were men carrying all the golden tableware of Perseus. Um, according to Roman tradition, the triumphal celebration ended with a public feast uh, for the victorious general at the Temple of Jupiter on the Capitoline Hill. Uh, these displays may have incited wonder and jealousy in the audience, uh, but perhaps the most important thing that happened was that uh, Aemilius Paulus brought back so much wealth from Macedon uh, that the Romans were able to suspend direct taxation of themselves uh, for well over, well over 100 years after this uh, triumph. Uh, with loads of money and the entire Mediterranean basin at their, uh, at their disposal, the Romans started to copy the fashions of Eastern Hellenistic kingdoms and the competition in banqueting already underway quickly escalated. Uh, and before we leave Aemilius Paulus, I, I want to mention that I, I, uh, I take my title for this talk uh, from a comment that he made. As he was touring Greece after his victory over Perseus, Paulus put, put on a lot of lavish banquets uh, funded by the loot from, from Macedon. Uh, Plutarch says that if anyone expressed amazement at the care with which he prepared these feasts, Paulus used to tell him that the same mental faculty was involved in taking charge of a military formation and a symposium. The only difference was uh, that you had to make one strike as much fear as possible into the enemy and the other give as much pleasure as possible to the guests. Now, Aemilius Paulus may have been being a little bit disingenuous here. Uh, pleasure is usually the goal of a feast, um, but like commanding an army, feasts are also a way to wield power. The host decides who's invited, uh, where they sit, and what they eat. The meal is a way to forge and reinforce alliances. The dishes, tableware, decorations, and entertainment are all the reflection of the wealth, sophistication, and ultimately power of the host. Dinners were a way to enhance one's social status, and if you were an amb ambitious Roman, your political prospects as well. We hear about many of the extreme banqueting practices of the second century BC from the complaints of older Roman families who could no longer entirely rely on their famous names uh, to gain high office. A series of sumptuary laws were passed in the second century. Um, these were attempts to outlaw uh, what many viewed as excessively fancy parties. Um, so you can see on this chart, uh, it starts out around 182 with an attempt to limit the number of guests you could bring to a dinner. Um, and then they try to limit the expenses. Um, yes, the, the Romans had a coin called an ass. Uh, I, I would say 100 asses is a, is a not unreasonable sum of money. Um, you can also see no non-Italian wines to be served, nor any fattened hens, um, and limits on the amount of, of uh, silverware that you can use. P. 
People tried to evade these laws uh, by having Italians host their, uh, their banquets. Uh, so in 143, we get the Lex Didia, which said, these rules now apply to everyone in Italy, not just Romans. Uh, and then they also penalize guests as well as hosts. Um, well, I won't, I won't read the rest, but uh, this will continue on. Um, and and this, th these measures seem to just fail. Uh, um, at least that's what one concludes from the fact that they keep on initiating new uh, sumptuary laws. There were other ways to punish those who dined in an excessive manner. The historian Livy uh, reports that during his censorship in 184, Cato the Elder expelled a man from the Senate for having murdered someone at dinner to entertain his boyfriend, a Carthaginian prostitute named Philip. A different version of the story has the guy beheading a prisoner instead. Um, a few decades later, Scipio Aemilianus, the winner of the Third Punic War, um, and the, you know, the guy who sacked and destroyed Carthage, uh, when he was censor, he punished a young Roman man for having served at a dinner a honey cake made to look like the city of Carthage. When the man asked why he was being punished, Scipio said it was because he had plundered Carthage before Scipio could. Sumptuary legislation and the, the actions of censors um, really failed to stem the tide of dining spectacle. Italy w witnessed massive transformations in food production and consumption in the second century BC. Uh, the wealthy were introducing new crops and new agricultural practices to the peninsula. Uh, they were also relying more heavily on slave labor. Slaves were status symbols every bit as much as an exotic dish, a fancy dining room, or an expensive villa. So moving, moving past the year 100, um, we come to the first century BC, which saw the end of the Republic ultimately in, after a series of brutal civil wars that began in the late 90s and continued sporadically down to around 30. Despite all the civil strife, the empire continued to grow. So on this map, you see the extent of the empire in 58 BC uh, when Caesar is about to undertake his uh, conquest of Gaul. The scale and luxuriousness of Roman banquets also continued to grow in this period. Uh, the richest Romans were getting even richer, and Roman generals were campaigning farther and farther from Italy. They brought back gold, silver, works of art, slaves, but also new crops. The general uh, Lucullus introduced the cherry tree to Italy uh, from Pontus in the uh, uh, north of what is now Turkey. Um, and uh, let's see. Um, we also hear of, of local innovation. Uh, so there was a guy named Gaius Sergius Orata who invented artificial oyster beds around this time. Uh, he used roof tiles uh, to, uh, to have the oysters grow on. Um, he was very rich. The potential profits to be had from urban demand for non-staple foods was apparently enormous and led to all sorts of other innovations in the construction and operation of Roman villas. Vero, who wrote three books on agriculture in the 30s BC, mentions artificial fish ponds, both fresh and salt water, aviaries, apiaries, snail enclosures, hair warrens, and even game preserves for boar and deer. Uh, the frescoes you see on this slide come from the Bay of Naples, where in the late Republic and early Empire, uh, wealthy Romans constructed uh, many, many luxurious seaside villas. They often decorated their, their villas in part with paintings of, of other villas. Uh, here you see a dining room from the Villa Ariana, uh, which is on the southeast part of the uh, Bay of Naples. Uh, the decorations actually date to the reign of Nero, but the villa was built in the late Republic. Um, and um, of course, they, they position the dining room so that uh, the people can have a nice view of the, uh, of the bay. Um, the villa, as with many villas, would have multiple uh, dining rooms, some, some for the winter, some for the summer. Um, and uh, this one was by no means the most luxurious in, in the neighborhood. So the parties thrown in these dining rooms could be spectacular. Uh, in terms of the food, but also in terms of the entertainment, uh, which could include all sorts of special effects. We hear, for instance, um, of a case in which a statue of victory was lowered through an opening in the ceiling of the dining room, uh, and then the statue placed a crown on the head of the guest of honor, uh, a victorious general. 
Uh, the menu at a feast celebrating the inauguration of a priest in 70 BC included um, all you can eat, raw oysters, baked oysters, mussels, thrush over asparagus, fattened hen, more mussels, clams, jellyfish, not sure how that would work, deer, boar, fattened fowl wrapped in dough, sow's udder, boar's cheek, baked fish, baked sow's udder, duck, boiled fowl, roasted fowl, and hare. Uh, the Romans also enjoyed role playing at a particularly notorious dinner held for the consul Metellus Scipio in 52 BC. The host created an apparently pretend brothel within his house staffed by women and at least one boy of noble birth. The future emperor Augustus apparently held a secret dinner in which all the guests came in the costume of a god uh, with, with um, Augustus appearing as Apollo. Uh, and one of the reasons this banquet was secret uh, was because apparently there was a famine going on in, in Rome at the time. Um, now, there are many other tales of extreme banquets from the late Republic, but for the sake of time, I'm going to skip to the most famous one, uh, which involves, of course, Antony and Cleopatra. Uh, supposedly, Cleopatra bet Antony that she could spend 10 million sesterces, a huge sum of money, on a single banquet. And she won the bet by dissolving a giant pearl in vinegar and then uh, drinking it. Now, modern scholars have, have pointed out that there's no vinegar actually capable of dissolving a large pearl uh, in, <laughs> in any kind of uh, reasonable amount of time. Uh, so it's possible this was a trick uh, and that the uh, pearl was recovered later. With the defeat of Antony and Cleopatra, we end the transition from republic to empire. Here you see the extent of the Roman Empire at the end of the reign of the first emperor, Augustus. Uh, the early imperial period brought still more change to Roman banqueting. The pace of imperial expansion slowed, um, and now emperors set the tone for uh, what and how to eat. Some behaved with uh, some degree of moderation, while others, most notoriously Caligula and Nero, uh, seem to have had no interest in restraint whatsoever. Uh, the Roman emperor is certainly uh, the wealthiest person in the Roman Empire, possibly the, the wealthiest person in the world at that point, um, had you know, vast resources dwarfing uh, those of the richest senators, and they could put on banquets of unprecedented scale. Uh, so a few quick examples. Caligula gave banquets for all of the equestrians and senators, including their wives and, and children, so that would be thousands of people. Um, and uh, at least on one occasion also gave everyone who attended uh, fairly expensive gifts. Uh, and then the, the most famous example, probably Nero. Uh, the main dining room in Nero's golden house, this is the one he built at Rome after uh, most of the city burnt down. Um, supposedly it had a constantly rotating dome. Um, other dining rooms in this house uh, merely had rotating panels that could scatter things like flowers over his guests. Nero's praetorian prefect, a guy named Tigellinus, held a dinner party on a raft in the middle of a reservoir at Rome, uh, and he placed uh, brothels, again, possibly pretend brothels, uh, around the edges of the reservoir, uh, and also brought in exotic animals and, and birds and, and even sea creatures, apparently, for this event. Other important things are, are happening in the first century. Uh, pepper is becoming more common as a seasoning for uh, Roman food. And remember, pepper has to be uh, imported all the way from uh, the south of India. It's also in this period that the pear uh, was introduced to Rome. Savvy entrepreneurs continued to develop agricultural properties uh, in the hinterland of Rome so that they could exploit the city's uh, massive demand for uh, all sorts of food. Finally, I get to some, some things in the uh, Brunier <laughs> exhibition. Uh, so here you see some of the, the ancient glass in the Brunier collection and on display in the exhibit. Uh, I believe most of these items can be dated to the Roman imperial period, uh, so first through fifth centuries AD. Now, a major technological development of the late first century BC, so right before this period, uh, was the invention of glass blowing. Glass blowing allowed for the manufacture of glass vessels uh, more quickly and easily and with less glass. Um, glass had, of course, uh, all kinds of applications, but let me just mention a few related to food production and consumption. Uh, one that will be dear to uh, friends of Iowa State uh, is the construction of greenhouses, um, which they start to do. And according to Pliny the Elder, the Emperor Tiberius so loved cucumbers 
uh, that he had a mobile greenhouse created uh, so that his gardeners could be uh, you know, um, certain to provide him with fresh cucumbers throughout the year. Uh, apparently cucumbers were a delicacy at that time. I, I don't know what to tell you. Uh, those who sold food could put uh, some foodstuffs in, in glass bowls uh, filled with water and so make them appear uh, larger uh, to prospective customers. Um, and another widely appreciated use of glass was for drinking vessels, uh, since glass wouldn't interfere with the taste of wine uh, in the way that metal cups could. One of the most disturbing banqueting uses of, uh, of, of glass was um, concerning seafood consumption, of course. Um, so the Romans loved a fish known as the sur mullet, which I, I gather is now the red mullet. Uh, and they discovered that as a sir mullet was being deprived of oxygen, it changed colors. Uh, so in the early empire, hosts of dinner parties started uh, providing their guests with live sir mullets in uh, glass bowls so that they could watch them slowly die and admire all the color changes that occurred uh, while, while this was happening. Once the fish was dead, it would be taken away and, and presumably you know, cooked up nice and fresh. Um, they also, by the way, killed sir mullets by putting them in glass containers full of, of garum, the, the fish sauce that I mentioned earlier. Um, now, lest we think a little bit too poorly of the Romans, I, I will say that, that some contemporary moralists did criticize this practice. Uh, since the Brunier has several uh, unguentaria, I thought I'd say a, a little bit more about them. Uh, an unguentarium is usually translated as a perfume bottle. And uh, glass perfume bottles appear well before the invention of glass blowing. Uh, they were initially made uh, with what's called the, uh, the core forming uh, technique. Um, but glass blowing simplified the process. Uh, this here is an imperial era uh, perfume bottle um, made with a glass blowing technique. And uh, what do these things have to do with banquets? Well, um, first off, it's important to smell good when you're literally touching uh, one or two other guests. Uh, I will say that bathing prior to a dinner party was, was another popular uh, choice. Um, Nero apparently had a specially constructed banqueting hall that sprayed perfume on the guests and, and possibly the food too. Hosts frequently gave gifts to their guests uh, and we hear that in some cases those gifts were perfume bottles uh, and some perfumes were, were quite exotic and expensive. Now, despite the name, uh, these perfume bottles might also contain wine, frankincense, uh, oils, or cosmetics. Um, so they could be gifts or they could be things that were used during banquets um, as, as part of the, uh, the, the serving process conceivably. Uh, now, before we move on from glass, I can't resist showing you a, a couple of the uh, most famous examples of what, uh, what was possible to do with glass um, in the, the Roman Empire. Um, so this is the Portland vase uh, which the Bernier should think about, you know, acquiring. Um, sure. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's pretty small and shouldn't cost that much. Uh, anyway, this was a blown glass uh, vessel uh, with carved exterior decoration. Um, and here, this is the Lycurgus cup, uh, which is an example of a cage cup. Um, and it also features uh, dichroic glass. Uh, and that is glass that displays a different color uh, depending on whether light is reflecting off of it or passing through it. And so some really spectacular achievements. So even though no one could compete with the emperor, Romans still tried to hold dinner parties to enhance their prestige. Romans tried to be trendsetters uh, with the dishes they served, uh, the dinnerware that they used, the entertainments they provided, the quality of the discussion at their meals, and, and so on and so forth. A banquet could be a way to show people uh, where you thought they belonged. Uh, and we hear of complaints about hosts who serve different quality wine to different guests. And we even hear of shades, umbrae, so guests who were invited to fill out a dinner party, uh, but were very much expected to, to keep their mouths shut. Just as hosts sought advantage through banquets, so too did guests. Uh, some invitations were highly sought after. Uh, either for the quality of the food and uh, drink or the, that of the company. Uh, in addition to the gifts frequently given out, it seems to have been accepted um, practice for guests to take away extra food stored in their napkins. 
A gifted writer could make or break a host's reputation with a, with a poem about a meal. Uh, one of the greatest works of literature to come out of the early empire um, is Petronius's Satirica, a Latin novel that unfortunately only survives in fragments. Um, the largest fragment is known as the Cana Trimalchionis, or Trimalchio's Dinner. Um, it's a satire on the pretensions of wealthy freedmen in Roman society. Trimalchio is a freed slave who had become obscenely wealthy, um, but is ignorant of the refined tastes and behavior of respectable upper-class Romans. Um, so he tries to put on an elegant dinner, but nothing goes right. Um, he has acrobats perform, but one of them falls on him. Uh, he tries to appear educated, but he gets the details of the Trojan War laughably wrong. Uh, speaking of Troy, Trimalchio also serves some Trojan-style dishes. Uh, this is where one food is uh, encased in another. Uh, so he, he serves a boar that's cut open to reveal live thrushes that flew around the room and then were captured and presumably cooked. Uh, and later on, a pig that's cut open to reveal sausages. Trimalchio then gets into an argument with his wife and then spends a lot of time talking about his own funeral monument. Uh, at the end of the party, he's demanding everyone pretend that he's dead. In the early empire, some imperial freedmen became exceptionally rich uh, and influential. Petronius's work seems to be an attempt to mock such people and reassure upper-class men uh, that they, they might not be as wealthy as freedmen, some freedmen, but they definitely have more taste. Uh, but I think this work also shows how banquets were one of the ways that people tried to raise their standing in society. Uh, from an aristocrat's perspective, a freedman's fancy meal was a threat to the social order. So here you can see the extent of the Roman Empire around the year 100. Um, the first half of the second century is often viewed as a kind of golden age for Rome. Uh, the empire was fortunate in that it was ruled by a succession of reasonably stable emperors from Trajan uh, to Marcus Aurelius. Many Roman subjects would not have, have viewed things quite this way. Uh, but if you were a Roman elite, uh, a senator, an equestrian, it was a really good time to be alive. The emperors of this period were unlikely to uh, kill you and confiscate all your property. The dinner party in this period remains a social battleground, though. Um, and people still take things to extreme. Um, now, since I don't want to uh, overstay my welcome here, uh, I'm gonna uh, keep things short and just talk about Hadrian for a moment. So Hadrian ruled the Roman Empire from 117 to 138, uh, and he traveled around the empire quite a bit during his reign, but he also constructed a monumental villa outside of Rome. Um, this complex is known as Hadrian's Villa, uh, and absolutely worth a visit if you happen to find yourself in Rome. Um, kind of hard to get to sometimes, though. Um, anyway, it covered over 120 hectares. Uh, that's about 300 acres. He named parts of the villa after parts of the empire, and the structures you see here were designed to allow him to pretend to be dining in Egypt. The long pool represents the Canopus, a branch of the Nile near Alexandria, and the structure at the end that you can see there is... Um, called the Serapeum. It was a summer dining room and it featured fountains and was modeled after Egyptian temples. In the later second and early third centuries, the Roman Empire started to experience some serious difficulties. There's a plague, some invasions, a lot of civil wars, and the banquet perhaps lost some of its importance in this period. Uh, the relationship between the emperor and the army becomes the crucial question and so we find emperors now dining in a way that emphasizes that relationship. Um, with that in mind, I want to skip ahead uh, a little bit to the emperor Caracalla. So on the left here, you have a bust of Caracalla um, from Naples. And on the right, a denarius of Caracalla from Ames. Uh, Caracalla ruled as sole Roman emperor from 211 to 217. Um, by most accounts, he was not a nice guy. Uh, he may have attempted to kill his father, uh, he definitely killed his brother. Um, he regularly threatened to kill his wife, um, and he apparently refused to eat with her. Uh, ultimately, apparently, he, he only um, exiled her. He probably had his share of expensive banquets with Roman elites, um, but it seems that it was more important for him to use dining to enhance his relationship with the army. The historian Herodian says that at least when he was with his soldiers, Caracalla used wooden utensils, ate local bread, ground up his own grain, and made his own barley cakes. Uh, there was no extravagance, and he ate 
only what was available to the poorest of the soldiers. Now, this asceticism wouldn't stop him from being assassinated by one of his own officers, um, but it was the sign of things to come. Thank you very much. <laughs>